A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. On December 31st, 1975, 45-year-old Charlie Roberson and his 41-year-old wife, Carol, had just returned to their Greenwood, Indiana home from running errands. By 10.30 p.m., Carol had already fallen into a deep sleep. Suddenly, their 18-year-old live-in nanny, Cindy White, began to pound on the door, screaming for them to wake up. Cindy pushed open the door and saw Charlie was awake and sitting on the edge of the bed. She ran to Carol and shook her awake, yelling that there was a fire in the house. Charlie ran into the living room and tried to put out the flames that had spread all around the room. The fire was rapidly moving to other parts of the house, and Carol and Cindy moved quickly toward the rooms of the couple's four children. Carol ordered Cindy to call the fire department while she rushed toward the children. Cindy stumbled through the smoke-filled hallway to get to the kitchen. When she finally got the operator on the phone, all she could do was scream, fire! Unable to talk in the unbearable heat and choking on the smoke, she hung up the handset and rushed back to help rescue the children. While Carol went back to get the younger children, Cindy took the oldest, six- and seven-year-old boys, to the nearest bedroom and tried to open the storm window, but it was stuck. There was a smaller glass window above it, but she had to let go of the children's hands in order to climb up and reach it. After hitting the upper window with her fist several times, she finally managed to break the small glass pane. And then everything went black. The oxygen coming from the open window fed the fire and created a backdraft. The explosion propelled Cindy out the window and onto the snow-covered ground. By this point, neighbors had gathered around the house and some of them rushed to help Cindy, who was momentarily knocked unconscious by the explosion. She quickly recovered and tried running back into the house, screaming, Where are the kids? Where are my kids? The neighbors held her back while taking care not to hurt her scorched limbs and face. When the firemen arrived, she broke free and ran to the front door of the house. When she grabbed the knob, it burned her hand so badly, she screamed and instinctively let go. A firefighter got to her before she tried again and pulled her off the porch. The fireman would later describe the blackened surface of her hands and face as, quote, pure charcoal. Finally, an ambulance arrived and Cindy was loaded into it. As she screamed about the kids and sobbed, they restrained her on a gurney and put an oxygen mask on her face. Cindy continued to fight against the restraints, hysterically crying and asking over and over, did they get out? Did they get out? Speeding to the hospital, the first responders never imagined the truth about the burned young woman in their charge. That the teenager, whose life they were trying to save, had deliberately started the fire. When we think of sports stories, we tend to think of tales of epic on-the-field glory or incredible against-all-odds comeback stories. But the new podcast, Sports Explains the World, brings you some of the wildest and most surprising sports stories you've never heard. Listen to Sports Explains the World on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. From Wondery and Campside Media comes Season 3 of the hit podcast, Suspect. This is a story of two victims, one murdered in cold blood, one imprisoned for a crime he did not commit. 
Listen to Suspect, Five Shots in the Dark, wherever you get your podcasts, or binge all eight episodes ad-free on Wondery Plus. From Wondery and Tree Fort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It's difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I'll give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Cindy White, Part 1. Cindy was transported to the local hospital. The ER nurses assisted the doctor as he debrided the wounds, which means they cut off the dead skin. Cindy had second- and third-degree burns on her forearms and hands. They also treated the first-degree burns on her face and neck. They removed the singed nightgown and found patches of burned hair, but there were no wounds on her scalp. She was admitted to the ICU in very serious condition. On January 2nd, two days after the fire, Investigators came to the hospital to briefly interview Cindy, but she was not in any state to answer questions. They returned three days later on January 5th, and this time, the investigators tape-recorded their interview. Cindy told them that she had smelled, quote, something that was smoldering hours before the fire had even broken out. And she claimed she had told Carol Roberson about it. Cindy had been living with the Roberson family since October, three months before the fateful fire. She worked as their live-in babysitter, helping to care for their four young children. Cindy's bed was the living room sofa where the fire had started. Cindy told investigators that on the night of the fire, the family ate dinner at 4.30 p.m. Charlie Roberson was the manager of a service station, and he started work early, so the whole family was usually in bed by 9 or 10 p.m. That night, after dinner, Charlie drove Carol and one of their sons to pick up a prescription at the drugstore. When they got back... Cindy told police that she wasn't feeling well and dozed off around 9.30 p.m. In her account to the investigators, she stated that, quote, I went to sleep, and the first thing I knew, I was sitting up gasping for breath. I was facing the Christmas tree and saw the recliner and wall on fire. It looked like smoke was coming out of the tree. It was almost two decades later when Cindy finally admitted to starting the fire that killed Charlie, Carol, and the four Roberson children. Twenty years later, the reason she gave for starting the fatal fire was just as horrific as the crime itself. In 2014, I interviewed Cindy White for my TV show, Facing Evil. I spent several hours getting to know her, and I can safely say that to really understand Cindy's motives, you need to look at her past. Cindy experienced a hell that should be known to no child. Cindy White was born in Greenwood, Indiana in 1957. She was the second of six children in her family. Being the oldest girl in the family, 
Cindy felt lucky that she didn't have to wear any hand-me-downs to school. And although she struggled with academics, she was well-liked by her teachers because she always strived to learn. In fact, before Cindy was eight, she could not recall any bad memories. Quite the opposite. She remembers living in a safe home with a seemingly stable, traditional family. It was a loving environment, one led by her father, Earl, and she reveled in being what she called a daddy's girl. But despite the jovial and loving nature her dad showed his children, he was not affectionate towards Cindy's mother, Emma. To her, he was cold and distant. Cindy was acutely aware of the difference in how he treated his children versus his wife, but she had no idea why, nor did it bother her. Her mother was loving and caring to her and her siblings, and that was good enough for her. At the age of eight, Cindy's idyllic life came crashing down all in one day. That day started out like any other for Cindy, She was home playing with her younger sister in the room they shared. Her dad came in and asked Cindy to help him by holding a light while he fixed the family car. It made her feel special to be able to spend some time alone with her father. Cindy felt honored that she was the only one he asked to help him. As he was under his car, she felt her father's hand up underneath her shorts. Surprised and confused at this unusual and unwelcome gesture, she pulled away and asked him what he was doing. He told her, this is how you show love, honey. From that moment forward, Cindy's life was never again that of a happy-go-lucky little girl. The sex abuse continued and intensified. Cindy did not understand that she was being sexually abused, but without question, she knew she did not like what her father was doing to her. Her father was easily able to convince her what he was doing was normal. In the interview, she told me, quote, I thought, well, if this is what he thinks he's supposed to do, then I guess it was okay. I was clueless. To me, showing someone that you love them was what he was doing to me. And he wouldn't tell me wrong. Having heard many similar stories from other adult survivors of child sex abuse, I asked Cindy a question I already knew the answer to. Did her father ask her to keep it a secret? Yes, she told me. It was going to be between him and me because... That's what daddy's little girls do. The abuse continued for six years, progressing to intercourse before Cindy was even 11. She didn't like that part of their relationship, but believed her father when he told her it was normal. It's rare for child sex abuse victims to disclose the secret to the other parent and Cindy was no exception. Sometimes the offender warns the child that if they tell mommy, quote, daddy will go to jail, the family will have no money, and everyone will die, including you. Or they might say, mommy will be mad at daddy, and you'll be blamed, and all your friends will know. Worse yet, some offenders threaten their child victim, saying, if you tell anyone the secret, I will kill your favorite pet, brother or sister, or I will kill you. But Cindy had another reason not to tell her mother about what was going on. Underneath her mother's kind and loving nature was a secret that made it impossible for Cindy to see her mother as the parent she wanted and desperately needed her to be. Her mother was an alcoholic, a severe, 
falling down kind of alcoholic, and her addiction eventually tainted all her relationships with her kids and her husband, Earl. Her mother was able to hide her addiction for years, but lost control of it as she got older. When work became scarce in Greenwood in 1969, Cindy's father found employment out of town and was gone from home Monday to Friday. Without Earl there to keep her in check, Emma's alcoholism only got worse. Emma was not abusive toward her children when she drank, but her problem was very severe and her behavior sometimes endangered her children. She drove into trash cans or mailboxes on purpose, playing a form of mailbox baseball, which frightened and scared her children. The only thing predictable about her mother was the unpredictability of her drunken behavior. Cindy was intensely aware of her mother's many drunken daredevil acts, and it weighed heavily on her. She recalled her mother drinking herself into a stupor almost every night, vomiting on herself and passing out on the living room floor. When this happened, Cindy would get her cleaned up and put her to bed, then feed, bathe, and get her younger siblings to bed as well. At the age of 10, Cindy became the woman of the house, as well as her mother's keeper. She did not want to burden her mom with any more problems. So she kept the painful secret about what her father was doing to her to herself. Several months after Cindy's father started working away from home, Cindy's older brother, Reggie, took over Earl's role. I noticed Cindy clenched her fists as she told me, quote, he stepped in to be the man of the house in every single way. When I asked her what she meant by that phrase, for the first time in our interview, Cindy had obvious difficulty in discussing the details. The pupils of her eyes became pinpoints. She gritted her teeth, and her breathing became noticeably more rapid. I could see whatever revelation was coming was certain to be very difficult. Reggie was only 14 years old when he stepped in as head of the household and he was keenly aware of the troubles and chaos in the home. With their mother's alcoholism spiraling out of control and their father out of town trying to earn a living, nine-year-old Cindy was left to care for her three younger siblings, all under the age of five. Eventually, her mother had another baby, and that circumstance left all the children vulnerable to Reggie. Despite his youth, he was already a dangerous predator. Reggie started helping their mother by running errands, fixing things around the house, and even disciplining the kids. He made her life easier, if only for his own motives. Reggie took advantage of her evening drinking bouts with the neighbors and subsequent blackouts. He knew exactly when the youngest children would be put to bed by Cindy and when and how he could get her alone. He waited patiently upstairs in the room she shared with her five-year-old sister. When their mother passed out and everyone else was asleep, he struck Some sexual predators are meticulously patient with their victims. They exhibit an endurance that can stretch years into the eventual act of snaring their prey. Often seen in that jovial neighbor who is just a little too eager to babysit your kids. 
or a family confidant who is often ingratiating, cajoling, even nice. This type of predator is known to be patient with his victims. Reggie was decidedly not this kind of predator. He wasn't interested in the grooming process of gaining his victim's trust. Reggie was a bully who took by force whenever and whatever he wanted. Reggie would threaten both Cindy and their younger sister, making them perform sex acts on him and beating them if they, quote, did it wrong. Like any other abuser, he didn't care about the permanent physical and psychological damage his selfish behavior was doing to his victims. He only cared about his dominance over younger, weaker humans and his sexual satisfaction. To secure their compliance, Reggie often kicked them with his work boots and hit them with his fists or a baseball bat. He was careful not to break any skin or bones. He tried to hit them where the bruises would remain inconspicuous to the casual observer. Reggie warned them if any of the bruises were visible, they were to claim they got them from falling at home or at school. If Cindy objected or resisted in any way, he would hit her sister more and threaten to kill the one-year-old baby of the family. Cindy believed him. Since she was bigger and stronger, Cindy stepped up to protect her sisters. I asked Cindy if there was a chance that Reggie knew that their father had been abusing her. I suspected that he did because Reggie was extremely bold and confident that he could get Cindy to submit to his domination. When Cindy said yes, she thought he did know. I asked her if she thought that her dad may have abused her older brother as well. It was a wild, out-there question, but Cindy's victimization was the common denominator between the two of them, and I sensed they were connected in some way. It would also account for Reggie's over-the-top anger and aggressiveness towards his younger, more vulnerable targets. It's not uncommon for young sexually abused children to be very angry and look to vent their rage on an even younger, vulnerable target. Cindy also believed that her father knew what Reggie was up to, but never punished him or tried to stop him in any way. The logical and sickening conclusion to be drawn from this is that her father not only knew that Reggie was abusing Cindy, but even approved of it and allowed it to continue when he was out of town. Such behavior is shocking, but it's not at all uncommon in families where a young child is sexually abused. Victims are shared or passed around among offenders, sometimes neighbors, friends, or anyone staying at the house. As a result, young victims feel helpless and trapped. They believe there is no way out for them until they are old enough to run away, fend off, or even kill their abuser. When Cindy was 13 and in eighth grade, she was required, as all students were, to take a course in sex education. When discussing the types of sexual relationships that are unhealthy or even criminal, such as incest or rape, Cindy learned that her father had been lying to her about, quote, showing his love. She realized that what he did to her was wrong and it was illegal. She also learned that what Reggie was doing was called rape and that he could be sent to jail. But she didn't tell on him because she was worried that he would kill her younger sister if she went to the police. As the weeks went by, she thought more and more about telling her mother what she had learned in sex ed. 
and what her father and older brother were doing to her. She was so upset by what she had learned that she became hyper-nervous around everyone. She wasn't sleeping well, and she was wetting the bed. Cindy put on weight at an alarming rate, which is also common among child sex abuse victims. When her father came home on weekends, she tried to avoid him as much as she could. But then it occurred to her that her younger sister was now nine, a year older than she was when their father started abusing her. Cindy decided it was better to let him do it to her than to her little sister. Finally, one day while doing laundry with her mother, an opportunity arose and she took the chance. Her mother saw blood on her underwear and asked her if she had her period. When Cindy told her that she did not, her mother wanted to know where the blood came from. Working up the courage, she told her mother, quote, Dad is messing with me. When Emma asked how, how was your dad messing with you? Cindy explained what she had learned in sex education. Cindy's mother did not want to believe it, but told her to get in the car and that she would take care of it. Cindy was relieved, thinking that the abuse would now stop. When her mother got in the car with her, she grabbed Cindy's face, looked into her eyes, and said, quote, You will not say anything about this to anybody, and I mean it. What I really want you to do is don't be alone with your father. Completely devastated, Cindy could only hope that Emma would also talk to her father and get the abuse to stop. However, that fantasy was short-lived when the abuse from her father continued. When she resisted, he got angry and looked for her sister. So she continued to submit to her father. Cindy blamed herself for her mom's increase of alcohol consumption and her grades plummeted. She was terrified that someone would find out at school or even worse, that her sisters at home would be in danger because she was not there to protect them. In July of 1974, Cindy's father, Earl, had a heart attack and died. Cindy became terrified because she was certain that her older brother would increase his abuse. As she and Emma were driving home from the funeral, Cindy told her that Reggie was now abusing her and her sister as well. Emma pulled the car over, slapped Cindy, called her a bitch and a slut, and told her she was lying. Her mother told her that she not only took her husband from her, but she was now taking her eldest son from her as well. Cindy was stunned. Cindy told me that her mother then became very calm and drove up on the railroad tracks. A train was coming, and Emma had locked the car doors and parked. Her mother calmly and quietly said to her, Take it back. Cindy said, Take it back? I can't take it back because it's the truth. Emma kept the car on the tracks with the train rapidly approaching. Terrified they were going to be killed, Cindy finally took it back and her mother drove off the tracks just in time. Cindy estimated that the car was only about 100 feet from the train when her mother pulled off. That incident which any prosecutor would characterize as an attempted murder-suicide, only served to teach Cindy one indelible lesson. Quote, It just told me 
not to say anything to anyone anymore. When I asked her how not telling anyone had worked out for her, Cindy shrugged, looked around the prison walls, looked back at me, and said, it got me here. Cindy dropped out of school at 13. Though her home life was a source of interminable stress and misery, school had become intolerable as well. Her attendance record was abysmal, and she was failing every single class. With her mother hating her for stealing, quote, her men, and the sometimes daily assaults from Reggie, Cindy began to contemplate taking her own life. But her world soon changed when her neighbor, Carol Roberson, knocked on the door and asked her mother if Cindy lived there. Carol had met Cindy when she was their paper girl and wanted to see if Cindy could babysit for her. Carol and her husband, Charlie, had gotten to know Cindy when she would come to collect the money for the paper route and she would play with their kids. Carol had noticed the bruises on her and asked about them. When Cindy told her she was just accident prone, Carol did not believe her, but she let it go. But now, the Robersons were asking Cindy's mother if she could move in with them as a live-in nanny. Her mother agreed as long as they paid her directly and not Cindy. Cindy never saw a dime of the money, but was so happy to be out of her house that she didn't care. She told me that she was just so happy to be part of a family. At the Robersons, she finally felt safe. She told me, I love the kids as if they were my own. I think kids are just little people who need to be loved, and I loved them. It struck me that Cindy was voicing her own deep-seated need for love. If she couldn't find it in her own home, maybe she could get it by helping to nurture the Roberson kids. Her only problem was leaving her little sisters to fend for themselves, but she knew if she stayed in that house with Reggie and her mom, she might not survive. But the love and admiration Cindy felt from the children wasn't the only benefit to living with the Robersons. Their father, Charlie, made her feel very special as well. He began to flirt with 15-year-old Cindy, who had never had any compliments. He would write her little notes and squeeze her arm while they were talking. Like her father, Charlie would also tell her to keep their flirting a secret. Cindy was ecstatic over the attention. This is very common among children who have been sexually abused by a parent. They tend to think that any older person that tells them, I love you, really means it. It's difficult for them to weed out the predators wanting to take advantage of them. Cindy wrote Charlie a note in a Snoopy greeting card professing her love for him. Their relationship was not physical, not even a kiss, but it was enough for Cindy to feel she was floating on air. Her newfound bliss came to an abrupt halt when, after only a few months, her mother demanded more money from the Robersons. She told them she needed Cindy to come back home, but would let her stay with them if they paid more. Her mother's plan did not work, and in a crushing emotional blow, Cindy was sent back home. Reggie, now 21 years old, had increased the scope of his violence and depravity. This is very common with domestic abusers. Every day in America, six to 10 victims of domestic violence, mostly women and children, are killed by their abuser. 
domestic abusers, male or female, don't start out killing their victim. They work up to it, pushing the limits of their violent behavior every time they unleash their wrath. I have no doubt Cindy would have been a murder statistic as well had she not escaped. Cindy's grandmother came to help out at the house because Emma's alcoholism was incapacitating her. Cindy tried one final time to reach out to someone. She told her grandmother what Reggie was doing to her and her sister. She knew that her grandmother could hear the beatings and abuse that was happening upstairs. Her grandmother's advice, the same as her mother's, just try to avoid him. She also told Cindy that, quote, we don't discuss what goes on. Cindy thinks her grandmother was also afraid of Reggie. He stole from her or demanded her money when he ran out of his own. Cindy's devotion to her siblings prevented her from running away. She had dropped out of school and the Robersons had cut her loose because of her mother's greed. She was needed around the house to help her grandmother with everything. And she was on her own against Reggie on the weekends. As Cindy saw it, there was no way out. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review. Follow Killer Psyche on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen one week early and ad-free. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. Please support them. By supporting them, you help us offer the show for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a survey at wondery.com slash survey. Next week on Killer Psyche, part two of Cindy White. We explore how Cindy's refuge became her prison. That starting fires is not as easy as it looks and that sentencing is not always fair. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Joshua Morales and Maxwell Carney with research and editing assistance from Ann Liu. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is production manager. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are production assistants. And the line producer is Oscar Guido. And we would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Seth DeLong. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media.